All right, so the last like 15 years of software engineering has been, been kind of a disaster and we're starting to see some of the uh, reasons behind that nowadays. Now, this video is gonna be mostly a rant. I just kind of wrote down a couple things on my post-it note and I'm just gonna go over some of the huge problems that I've been seeing in software for the past like 15 years. First of all, I wanna start off with the, well, you know, why am I choosing 15 years? Now, so 15 years, so the idea of software engineering has been like super hot. Like one of the main reasons behind that is there's been pretty much like free money, like very low interest rates for businesses to like add new products, to expand new like software platforms, to build up new teams, to like kind of like take advantage of like new business. And that's like good and also bad. It made a lot of people get into the industry, but at the same time, we got like huge companies like Netflix, eBay, uh, Amazon, Apple, like all the big fan companies, like it allowed them to explode to the levels that they are today. And it's also allowed like smaller companies to like advance and create custom software for something that they need, right? But there's also like a kind of a darker side of that is that because of all of this kind of like uh, free R&D uh, capital to like spend on building up new products, uh, it has created a created in 15 years like this ecosystem of where companies had to worry about retaining talent. So this idea of like keeping smart people that know your business where they are. But no matter what they did, like during this time, no one like stuck around to most jobs more than like a year or two. And if anyone's actually been entrenched in a business, like one or two years is like kind of nothing. You're kind of really understanding the business at that point. This is a huge problem with software because if you're in there trying to build a product to make the business go better, and you're like building this structure and this architecture and the software to like make things do more business for the company, and then you just dip out after a year, like that, that's a problem because you don't, you're don't you not retaining any knowledge for building that system in the first place. And someone new is gonna come in and try to be like, oh, um, I don't really know what's going on here. I'm gonna build something new. So you're like having this vicious cycle of like creating new software because the new person come in doesn't wanna build like off of legacy something that was someone else's idea. They wanna build something new. They wanna build something greenfield. So like there's this constant cycle in a lot of companies where they're just kind of coming in, rebuilding new stuff, always saying the old code is crap and just getting away with it. And that was completely fine. And so now we're kind of reaching the ramifications of that is because like now we just have like some software that is just like completely wedged into the business and critical for them to like do business in the first place. But it's just kind of like not used. It's like they have this fragile like build that is critical to the business, but no one wants to upgrade it. No one wants to touch it. It's very fragile to even like be able to upgrade the system in the first place. That's a huge problem. So this kind of brings me to my next point is that there's, um, during this time, there's this idea uh, that is still sticking around, but this idea of big tech and kind of like microservices. This can mean a couple things, but um, first off, I hate microservices. I have many years of experience to explain why I hate them, but let's talk about the bigger picture. So during this time, we, Fang, Manger, whatever you wanna call like the, you know, the big heavy hitters in big tech, like Facebook or Meta, um, Netflix, Apple, Amazon, like all these big things, Google, and they all have like this sort of very godlike existence in the industry. Everyone wants to work for a big company and get paid big money. Now, with that, not only the adulation of like people trying to get into the job, but there's also this adulation of like how companies want to work like Google. They look at Google and they're like, oh my God, they scaled up and they have, you know, 100,000 paying users. Like, I want to do that. Oh, Facebook has a billion users. I want my company to have a billion users. So this idea that like everyone wants to like scale to these big heights, even though the business doesn't really support that idea, like, uh, 95% of businesses don't need to scale or even think about problems that the same thing that like big tech has, but yet all of these smart engineers are trying to build up towards that end goal for these huge tech companies where the businesses themselves, they don't need that. Here's a shocker is that if you're working for an insurance company or like a finance company, odds are you don't have Google problems. You don't have Netflix problems. You don't have scaling problems. 
More often than not, you have under a thousand active users a day, and so you don't need to worry or build your system to support hundreds of thousands, nine figures, it's like seven figures of people like logging onto your system. Like that is not a problem that you should build towards. And yet I've seen in many different companies where people are trying to build a system that is, is, is scalable, that, that they will be able to handle 100,000 concurrent users for an internal app. Like none of it really made sense. The product didn't fit pragmatically to the, what they were trying to solve in the business in itself. And one of those big things is microservices. A lot of people think that like, that's the way you scale and that's the way you like kind of divide attention. So you can have a team that works on this sort of thing. Like this mono repo has gotten too big. I'm too worried about like this one source of like all of our code. Let's break it up into microservices because that's what the big boys do. That's what, you know, big tech does. And I think that will work for our business. Uh, guess what? It probably won't. Microservices are there to divide your team so that you're only focused in concentrated topics, parts of the business, and also you're able to scale up things that are not to handle certain things so that you don't have to worry about all of the system. But guess what? When you break up the system, the complexity doesn't go away. The complexity is now just in a bunch of different spots. Here's something that most people don't realize in like smaller engineering teams is that if you break up your the, the complexity of the business into like smaller teams you still need to increase headcount so that you have different people focusing on the right things and then you run into the problem that that uh, maybe a team of two or three engineers are covering five to ten uh, github repositories that they have to maintain and upgrade and if there's a prod support that involves six different systems then like good luck figuring that out just because complexity in a business or in an app is, is becoming hard to deal with, breaking it up is not gonna make it easier. In a lot of ways, it's gonna make it harder. So the moral of this like small little rant about like the big tech adulation and the big tech like uh, we need to interview, we need to like build just like big tech is that you don't have the same problems as Netflix does. You don't have to worry about eventual consistency. You don't have to worry about microservices or scaling or like, more often than that, you just gotta serve your internal business users and get more business to the door. And that can usually happen with just one simple app. But yet we're still out here trying to build microservices and trying to build like the most complicated system when, guess what? Like most businesses probably just need a simple CRUD app that will just like take care of some simple tasks that makes people work easier. And so my final point, my final little rant I have is that during this time is there has been a huge push for open source. Um, and open source is great in some situations. So having something that is community upheld is something that everyone can get behind and so that like we can build and know exactly what the software provides to you. It is, is open to all, right? But at the same time, when it came to like people advancing their careers, there was something called RDD, which is resume driven development. All right, I'm editing. I just realized I didn't really talk about what RDD, resume driven development really is. And it's the idea that like you are building something, you're choosing to make software that doesn't serve like the business or the like team that you're working on, but it serves you. Like you wanna learn that language. You wanna learn that framework. You wanna say that you built this pattern and you kind of disregard the actual requirements of the business, but you're doing it for yourself. So you're trying to build your resume by choosing the things that you want to do. So a lot of advice of like trying to get new jobs or trying to, you know, get to a senior position or a director position is to uh, contribute to open source, is to build your own libraries. So we had an entire like generation of developers that were creating small little libraries that uh, changed the color of your output or they did, they were like a small tool and they inserted them into the business that they were working on and they just like moved on with their lives. Now that hiring is a little bit harder and we have all these like legacy apps that have these links to these old like uh, open source libraries is they are abandoned. Open source at the root of it, the foundation of open source is built off of free work and free work more often than not does not result into long-term support. At some point, unless you have like an actual profitable business that's backing the project 
or it's like such a popular framework that it is mission critical for a lot of businesses, you're not gonna have long-term support for upgrading the app for security vulnerabilities, for upgrading the app to support different integrations, different languages, different ways to approach the problem. Because it's built off of free work, you're not, it's not gonna live there forever. So we have, we have this graveyard, these businesses have this graveyard of all these apps that are, are linking up to like outdated and abandoned libraries that um, all of a sudden we need to start upgrading because there's, there's security problems. A lot of cloud services don't even support like these old languages, the frameworks. A lot of cloud services are, are abandoning support for these older systems, right? So when you try to upgrade and then you see that some of your libraries do not adhere to the new uh, requirements to the cloud. Look at this library that I brought in 10 years ago. Oh, it's it's mine now. I have to maintain this. I have to bring this in and bring it up to speed because no one else, because it's abandoned. It's an old library that no one uses anymore. Now I shouldn't have like this big of a rant or this visceral of a rant because like, honestly, for the past like five or six years, this has been the bulk of my entire work is working with legacy profitable apps that are working for profitable businesses and trying to maintain and keep them up to date. And that's why like, I run into this a lot is that, that I see where this boon of software engineering has benefited a lot of businesses and made them be more efficient. But now when we have to start like making sure that they're upgraded and that they are, that they are supported by their cloud system, it becomes very difficult to dig into these old software programs to like trying to upgrade them to make sure that they are compliant. It's not as easy as just saying like, ah, oh, let's throw in a container and just be good with it. There's also a lot of security implications behind that. So there's my rant. My rant is that we had 15 years of what seemed like a great boost in software engineering. And we got some great companies out of it. We got some great tools and technologies for all of the world essentially to benefit from, but there was also this kind of darker side as, of uh, waste and kind of mismanagement of expectations and building systems that are not pragmatic towards actually solving a problem. And now a lot of us senior engineers are just kind of dealing with this old creaky software and trying to up, uh, upgrade it when we can because otherwise the business dies. Like. You ha I have to dive in, otherwise my clients do not have a way to, to make money. <laughs> like that's, that's what it comes down to, and that's where I live right now, is just living in these old libraries and these old systems and just trying to bring them up to date and have them working so that they can actually provide a value for the service. So yeah, I know that it was a lot. I know that's kind of a big rant of a, uh, talking about the last 15 years of software, but... I hope that was either A, entertaining or enlightening to people who are getting into the field. If there's anything I want people to get, uh, come away with is that like always dive into what kind of code will actually serve the business that you're working for and never be scared of old code. Just dive in and learn. And if it is working, then to some degree that is good code. If it is working in production and is serving a purpose, it's good code to an extent you can make it better and you can learn a lot about systems if you dive right in. Don't be scared, don't always go to the shiny new thing, just dive into the old and you will learn so much more. Anyways, that's it for me. Check out this video if you want guys and I'll see you guys in the next one. See ya.